everybody crafting journey here that journey took over on instagram welcome to another edition of crafting and crime daily where we cover live trials yes we are currently covering the trial of danielle rednick redlick rednick redneck what the heck's her name anyway it's in the description um <laughs> yeah in fact <laughs> I, I accidentally misspelled it and came up Daniel Radcliffe and uh, he was the Harry Potter guy. So no, not that trial. <laughs> no. I gotta get my coffee. Okay, I've had a few sips of my coffee. It's Danielle Redlick. R-E-D-L-I-C-K. Redlick. Okay. Now that that's straight, <laughs> let's talk about what national day is it? It is National Sewing Machine Day. Why do we need a sewing machine day? I don't know. Mine is, where the heck is mine? Um, I have one. <laughs> I, it's in this room somewhere. The last time I got it out was when I was sewing masks back in, you know, for COVID. Uh, back in 2020, 2020, and this is 20, two years ago. Yeah, I used to sew all the time. Um, I made backpacks and um, th these things that you could drape over the side of your bed to put your books in. And I would, I was not good at making clothes because I would pick out a pattern that I thought would fit me, you know, and I knew you'd have to go a few sizes up and it just, I could never get these darn things to fit me. And I just, I'd sew it up and it'd be too small. I'm like, oh, what? Yeah, I, I'm not, Project Runway, no, not for me. <laughs> no, but it's nice to have a sewing machine around, you know, in case you need to mend something. Um, but the sewing machine, like before the sewing machine, people had to hand stitch everything. Like this is what women did. You know, they were making their own clothes and because clothing was very expensive. But once, uh, you know, the, the um, first patent in the U.S. was in 1842. And so once it got to this country and, you know, the clothing prices started coming down because it started to become industrialized. I mean, it just changed everything. So now women had all kinds of time on their hands to do other kinds of crafting, you know, like crocheting and cross stitching. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we didn't have to make our own clothes anymore. It is, and this is what I always thought, it is so much cheaper for me to just buy a dress than to make it, to, to buy the material, uh, to even with the invention of the sewing machine, to buy the material, the pattern, and all the time that it takes to do it, I could get it off of Amazon super cheap. <laughs> and it fits. But, you know, because it, it's so industrialized that, you know, they, they can run off thousands of these in, in a matter of minutes, you know. the um, Why should I sit and sew that? But anyway, so how do we celebrate National Sewing Machine Day? Well, here you go. Um, you can share your favorite sewing tips and tricks um, in Crafting Journey Facebook group. Yep. You could post a photo of your favorite sewn item, like something you've sewed. I would love to see it. Put that into the Facebook group. Something you sewed. I'm, I think it trying to think if I have something around here that I've sewn other than those masks I'll I'll look and see and then I'll see if I can put that up and name your favorite sewist sewing machine store or sewing tool now my sewing machine is a brother sewing machine and hands down I love it love it I've had, you know, singers in the past and other kinds, but the brother, you know, I just loved this machine. It did all those fancy embroidery things. I'm going to find, I, I can at least find some pictures. Actually, here's one right here. I, I'll put one right here. Um, first, I got to find it, but I'll put it there. Yeah, of something I made. Super cute. I digress. Let's talk about the Danielle Red, Red, Oh, here we go again. Redlick case. 
I'm going to get it right. Um, this was day two of the trial on Friday. Now, I got to tell you, this woman, she's now in the picture that I put on the thumbnail. She's got dark hair, but apparently since she's been in prison, not able to dye her hair. Although I, I, I know people, I know people in prison can dye their hair. I guess she just chooses not to. And she's only in her 40s, but she's totally gray. And she seems very heavy, uh, like her eyelids are very heavy and she's very, um, I don't know, almost like she's drugged. Like, yeah, that's the impression I get. Like she's heavily medicated. Um, at least on the first day, the second day, I thought maybe a little less so. Maybe she was really scared on the first day, but the second day she seemed a little bit more like she was writing things down and sometimes she'd nod her head. And so she seemed a little bit more with it. But like the first day, I thought this woman was just going to nod off. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'm working on this diamond painting. So let me, um pull back the cover. Uh, let me show you. I showed it in the live yesterday. This is called A Big Wave of Kana Kanagawa. This is a Diamond Dots painting that I started a few years ago. And I stopped because I ran out of one of the diamonds. And I finally found the diamond uh, out at Hobby Lobby over the weekend. So here it is, The Big Wave of Kanagawa gorgeous huh gorgeous so I thought I'd work on this you know while I'm getting ready to go to the retreat the craft retreat um, for those of you who don't know what that is that's a it's a it's a it's a getaway for crafters um, that's planned by one of my really good friends and um, it's limited I think she accepts 45 people and so um, we just all get together and craft all week long. Cro I'm going to teach you a beginning crochet class. Um, there's advanced crochet. There's going to be some rock painting, some paint pouring, um, diamond painting, all kinds of crafts going to be going on there. Cross stitching, I'm sure. Um, got a lot of cross stitchers. And then there'll be a lot of vendors there selling things. Um, uh, so I, I'll give you a little footage. I promise <laughs> you'll get to see some of what's going on there okay so while we talk about the Danielle Radcliffe case I gotta remember what which one was I doing okay I do remember so the first person on the witness stand is a, um, cr a crime scene investigator and she does testify that at some point they did go back to the home um, to get DNA from um, Danielle. Um, they got a, they had a warrant for a DNA swab and a warrant to search the home again. So when they went back, they picked up like all the computers and I guess maybe they had missed some the first time. Yeah. So they, they got all of that. They swabbed her. Danielle was not happy about because the kids were there. She's like, the kids are outside. And, you know, it, it was a, a very awkward uh, moment for her. Um, but and they had it, of course, all on tape for everybody to hear uh, how upset she was by the whole thing. Because they actually put her in handcuffs while they did the search and while they did the DNA swap. Really? <laughs> but, you know, I guess it is a murder investigation. So one of the things they found on this uh, computer was an email. Now, I'm going to read to you some of this email. This email was written in 2018 to her husband. Now, it just, it's, it's very lengthy. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it's just sort of evidence of the strife that's going on in their marriage and how she's struggling with it and maybe tipping the edge of sanity here. So I'm going to put it up here so you can read it as well. But let's see taking the time to write this morning because things need to be addressed. Just going to cut to the chase. I don't, if I don't, then my emotions get let out in other ways that don't always serve me or anyone well. Ooh, that's incriminating. <clears throat> Clearly yesterday, 
is a good example on the beach. By the way, I think it's funny how you chose to take the morally superior stance by telling me I'm not a Christian because I had a sharp tongue with you regarding your total, totally immoral, shady actions that put truly loving, loyal, well-intended, caring people, namely your wife and kids, in a state of gain and emotional turmoil, not once, not twice, but continually and relentlessly. First of all, let me say, this is a run-on sentence. <laughs> it's just, this is one of those sentences that goes on and on. Why do people write like that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, <laughs> I digress. Continuing on. I know I'm bitter at times, I admit, and no, it's not pretty. And I do need to get a grip, as you put it. But you have a lot of nerve as well. Although my words may be cutting, they are only sounds, a dull knife compared to the sharp, disloyal, deceiving, phony, and never-ending selfish knife you continue to twist in my back as if it's a sport at this point. Of course, someone would be messed up, traumatized, and may act out. Mm. This is very incriminating. It's very, it's almost um, prophetic, you know, that she writes this several months before she kills the man. I mean, seriously, the latest discovery in what continues to unfold as the horror story of the century, you know that letter, speech, page of thoughts, garbage, whatever you want to call it, is about as truthful as it can get in a marriage ending or not. Not to mention it shows what a dishonest, unscrupulous person you are. She likes the adjectives, doesn't she? Not sure if you ever realized that. And blaming it on someone else is sad. In that letter, you are far from Christ as the devil, and your lies about it are <laughs> all are too. As if the doubt on top of it from me wasn't great enough already, how could I ever be at ease after that? I never recovered from the David sessions, honestly, and certainly you will never help to reverse or move any mountains for me. I know that for sure. I never met anyone who convinces themselves over and over that their immoral, conniving actions are not just that, but are somehow justified and or reasonable, no matter their cost, harm, or others, I notice whenever I confront or attempt to process, work through the cuts, your knives wound me with you have, with you have a hard time trouble admitting the true nature of just how sharp and dangerous their edges are. <laughs> what is with all these weapons? They are nonetheless weapons, and you are always claiming the right to hurt me with them when I asked you about the hurts you put me through. I hate the answers you give me. I mean, how do you love a man who will, and then they have it blanked out, because you are acting in agony over the aftermath. See, I don't know what the heck she's talking about. I don't know if he knows what the heck she's talking about. But there's a lot of references to knives in this thing, which could be completely coincidental, but because she clearly likes the um, the adjectives and the... It, and this letter goes on and on. There's more. Um, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. Holy moly. So then on the stand is the dating site owner. So we know she we know she joined this dating site called Mindful.com. Mindful. Um, and uh, he comes on and he explains the site. And uh, man, you got to be careful when you join these sites. He had access to everything she ever did on this site. Every time she went on the site, every time she deleted a picture, every time she, you know, uploaded, changed her profile, talked to somebody, you know, it's all there. Now, I don't know if the substance of the conversation was there. No, it was. The substance of the conversation was there because he read one of them. Um, uh, yeah, no. Um, and then all of that can be gotten by the police, you know, if you're ever accused of murder. So... Uh, be careful on the dating sites, guys. So, she was texting this guy, Mark, and um, she mentioned in her profile that she, you know, wanted the whole Romeo, Juliet um, love story. It's not sweet. Shakespeare. That wasn't a stabbing. It was a poisoning, right? Yeah. Okay. Then he goes through, because he's got a whole chronology of everything she's ever done on this dating site. So then on the morning of the murder, you know, or, after, you know, that 
11 hour window. She is on that dating site from 5.30 in the morning on and off till 7.22 a.m. Checking messages and stuff. Yeah. What? <laughs> Before she calls 911. And the next person on the stand is a blood splatter expert who is older than dirt. Bless his heart. He's been doing blood splatter analysis for 44 years. And I would say if he's not retired, he's uh, soon to be retired. <laughs> um, so, he, oh, wow. He goes through the whole education process of blood splatter. Like, you know, he's got diagrams and PowerPoint and I'm like, oh yeah. Bottom line, here's the thing. So he analyzed all the photographs and found blood spat blood splatter and he called it surveillance splatter. Surveillance splatter? Yeah. And he says that happens when there's drops. Like something upright, you know, is dropping blood onto the floor, which would be consistent with him being stabbed and dropping stuff onto the floor, which, and he finds this, and then the drop, when it hits the floor, it splatters into other areas, um, like walls and cabinets and floorboards. So he found evidence of that in the kitchen, um, Unfortunately, he didn't find the evidence of the drop because it had been compromised by her attempts to clean it up. But uh, interestingly enough, those drag marks that um, there's photographs with that looks like it honestly looks like a body was dragged through the house. Um, but I suspect it was the towels and not a body because he says that... Uh, there's no evidence that the blood that was on, that these were drag marks, body drag marks. No, there was, <coughs> the blood was diluted. The, the blood that remained there was diluted, is showing that someone had compromised what was there in an attempt to clean it up. But the door to the bathroom had no blood splatter on it. There was, so... But those marks go all the way up to the bathroom, which would lead you to believe that the door to the bathroom was open. Hmm. Interesting. So what his testimony is telling me is that he was stabbed and he was walking around dripping blood from the kitchen to the bathroom um, and at some point makes his way to the living room where he collapses and, pa you know, passes away. But this person was, this uh, expert was asked, you know, how long could a person walk around alive dripping blood? And he's like, that's the question for the medical examiner. You're going to have to ask him because we don't even know how many times he was stabbed. She admits to stabbing him one time in the shoulder. So, yeah. So, you know, bottom line, because this, this whole crime scene was compromised by someone's attempts to clean everything up, he was not able to kind of reconstruct what exactly happened. I mean, I surmise what happened. I'm, that was just my guess, uh, you know, that this guy was walking around. But he's not able to say that. Now, the last person on the stand was, oh, the next person on the stand is the nosy neighbor. We always have to get a nosy neighbor, don't we? We have to have a nosy neighbor, you know. Um, this guy, he says, you know, we weren't friends. They only came in my house once, but I've lived there for 40 years. And yeah, I knew who they were. I saw them out. They would be out walking the dog. And they always seemed cordial up until the last year or so when they would be, you know, uh, how did he put it? Uh, but, but you could tell there was some bickering going on, you know, there. Um, he said he was aware when um, 
uh, Michael moved out of the house and then when he moved back in um, and he said when he moved back in see things seemed to calm down he said there was what a point in time where like he was um, she came outside she's yelling and screaming at him and he leaves and he said you know he was very calm he just gets into his car and he leaves and she's yelling and screaming at him um, but he said after they split up and then they got back together things seemed to calm down and that was his testimony the nosy neighbor we always have to have the nosy neighbor don't we so after that is the a digital forensic expert and I am going to be honest um, my weekend was not a good one um, some of you know you know there was I just didn't have a good weekend a lot of angst over the job situation but I have a game plan I'm just gonna let them fire me yeah but so anyway I did not listen to this digital forensic expert but I did listen to the point where he said that he had downloaded from Danielle's cell phone 40,000 pages of PDFs 40,000 that's how much stuff was in her phone and a lot of it had been archived like she had been trying to delete it so more to come on that um because there is a way he can sort through that and um for the important stuff so uh i will listen to that and bring that to you tomorrow but he said he didn't even print it out because 40,000 pages a stack of 500 pages is like this you know so can, can you imagine 40,000 it would that's a lot that's a lot now I, I know some lawyers who would say print it all out print it out make me a copy <laughs> I've worked with people like that I'm like print it out it's 40,000 pages print it out okay <laughs> old school print it out so, what happened this day in history? June 13th, 1966, the Supreme Court establishes the Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law, blah, blah, blah. This was a decision called Miranda versus Arizona. So this all came about in 1963 when a woman maintained that she was abducted and raped and she described her attacker. She described a vehicle and they caught up with this guy named Miranda. They take him into custody. They put him into a lineup. Uh, he fails a polygraph she does not identify him in the lineup and during his, his interrogation he gives a confession that really matches the details of what she's accusing him of um, he later says he recants uh, he says you know uh, he didn't know he didn't he had the right not to say anything um, he hires an attorney for a hundred dollars the attorney sits and asks no questions during the trial doesn't do a single thing during a trial he gets convicted um his conviction is later overturned and he's um, retried and convicted again he uh, remained in prison uh until 1972. so i'll tell you what happens after that so uh this goes all the way to the supreme court because of the miranda issue well, we, we know it now, as Miranda, but the fact that he didn't know, he didn't have to say anything. They didn't tell him, you know, you could get an attorney. So now we know that every, every person needs to be read their rights. Um, and they are, and sometimes unnecessarily, it, it, it's, it's sort of ad nauseum. They, everybody gets read their rights, you know, in an abundance of caution, um, you get read your rights which uh, yeah uh, it makes sense to me in some cases you you even have to sign that you, they've been read to you um so interesting interesting case so what happened to this guy well he ended up getting killed in a bar fight <laughs> was stabbed to death uh outside of a poker room in the bathroom outside of a poker room yeah in 1976 so 
that is the show for today. It's, you know, another short show. I do owe, owe you the rest of the McStay family murder. How did the trial turn out? I'm going to, I've got that for you. I promise. Um, so guys have a great day. It's Monday. I don't, we'll see if I still have a job at the end of the day. You know, maybe I'll get lucky and get fired. Who knows? I, you know, I've sort of spent the week in trying to um, come to grips with it. It is what it is. If it happens, it happens. Um, I'm not going to quit. No, I will not give them that satisfaction. So, it is what it is. Guys, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow on Crafting and Crime Daily. Take care. Bye.